This is my second time trying to record this stupid video, but I'm going to try and teach the opening, opening principles, opening, just an opening crash course, all right? So let's start off with opening principles. Let me just go full screen here, it'll be easier. To start off with, the first concept is central control. You want to control the center of the board, which is roughly this. You might consider it to be these squares too, but mainly just these four squares and these type of squares is kind of what you want to control. The main way of controlling this is with your pawn. So for example, with your e-pawn. Now, I assume you know how all the pieces move already and maybe have already played some games. And now we're just trying to get some stuff to figure out how to play better. And the concept here is that you're controlling these squares, right? And then, of course, if they play something like this, you can just control the whole center. And the central control is good because a lot of stuff will happen in the center. So you, it's just generally good to open up and get as much control of the board because the center makes up a pretty big chunk of the board and possibly the most important chunk of the board, the most active part. So it's good to have a general Generally, it's a good principle to have as much central control as you can. You can also get central control with your knights. So you can try and control the center with your knights by putting a knight here. For example, you get a lot of central control. And you're controlling the central You can also go for a more interesting technique. For example, in the English opening, you try and control the center in a different way. So, uh, for example, this, where you're trying to control the center with your bishop as well as your pawn like this which is a different more unique way of trying to control the center now uh, besides just controlling the center another good principle to note is probably the f pawn now generally you don't want to push your f pawn why is that well if you look at all of your chess pawns every single pawn on this which is the most weak pawn Probably this pawn because it's only protected by the king. If you push this, there's no piece that can go here to block the check from here. There's one piece that can block this check though, which is the G pawn. That is the only piece capable of blocking it. So, for example, this could become a problem maybe in the from scan, for example, where you get this position and then you play something silly like this and you have mate in three. Well, why is that? check push and then you can sacrifice the queen this is because there's nothing to block this and the bishop then and sweeps and gives you check another problematic with the f pawn is an a amos checkmate known as the uh fool's mate For example you have this and then you do the checkmate it like that so it's very dangerous F pawn because it opens the king and there's not much benefit. There are a few examples where uh, pushing the F pawn is a fine move and people play it, although I still don't recommend it. For example, you have the king's gambit where you play and play like a gambit, where you gambit your F pawn and then try to build and control the center better by getting rid of their central pawn. Another example is in the Vienna gambit, another gambit where you push this F pawn. And this is generally the line a lot of people play if they play the Vienna, is this Vienna Gambit. And the idea is they take this pawn, your idea is to push this and attack the knight. Uh-oh. Uh <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Alright, well. Anyway, another concept which might use it is, for example, the Dutch defense. The Dutch defense is against, say, D4. It gets a lot of openings. D4, C4, you can play the Dutch also play it against in this right so Dutch is a very is a common idea where you play this as a defensive move it does make sense against e5 because this is the duras gambit and it's kind of a bad move that you can be completely losing if you play like this because you have to move queen h5 check and if you play g6 you're just absolutely losing so be very careful with your f pawn and generally if you're a beginner or just at most levels pushing the f pawn is not a good move but there are exceptions where it might even be the best move. For example, on a very strange line of the Karo Khan, this, a four is debatably the best move where you defend this pawn like this. It's debatable with the move taking this pawn as well. Now, if you play this, you're probably going to take it like this. But you can also play 
here. Against the Karl Khan, this is still a very playable variation and opening. But I still win. Now, there's also the birds opening, of course, with this play like this. Anyway, so that's another principle. Remembering that this F pawn is very dangerous. Another example of the F pawn being dangerous, just to keep hammering this in, is the concept of scholar's mate. It's a checkmate pattern where, say, someone tries to play principled against you, right? So they're coming in here, they're trying to attack your pawn, you're just like, all right, I'm going to defend this pawn. Then they bring the bishop, and you're like, all right, I don't like this queen, I'm going to develop my knight, add some pressure, and then you get checkmate. It's because the f-pawn just has to have two attackers, and it can wreak havoc on your position. So you have to be very careful. I think that's enough discussion of the f-pawn. Another concept is piece activity. When you develop a piece, uh, you're not going to want to develop it to a square that's not very active. For example, in this position, right? You don't want to develop your bishop here. Why not? Well, that's because this bishop is not going to do much. It's kind of just not unneeded at defending this pawn. You don't really need to, which is really all this is doing here. Besides that, it's just blocking this pawn from pushing and it's not really controlling any squares here. You can still move it here, but it was already doing that. And But it does open up the ability to castle, which is debatably the benefits of playing this. It's not a horrible move, but it's not exactly a good move either. For example, there are two much better plays of playing with the bishop here. This is in Spanish, a very complicated opening, but it is the top line according to engines, and it's technically the best move in this position. The idea is to add pressure to this knight, which can lead to some very complicated games. And they'll, your opponent will probably either respond with one of these two moves. You may take, although it's kind of rare at higher levels, to take this knight. And taking this pawn can lead to problems with the queen. There's also the Italian game, a far more common variation, a much better for beginners, where you just give as much control, the bishop as much openings as possible. And this also can come from the bishop's opening. That will get into our next principle we're going to discuss. This also can lead to certain attacks on the f-pawn, so it's generally a pretty strong move. And it also allows gasoline. So generally you want to work peak activity. That's similarly why you're going to develop your knight here or here. It's not very active here. What is your knight going to do from here? It can't... It's not really good controlling these squares. Of course, there's exceptions to this as well. There are cases where you're going to put your knight here, but it's a very rare and few openings where you're developing your knight outwards like this, or it's a move that isn't complete, very much losing. So it's much better to have this, where it's controlling the center and it has a lot more activity, and possibly it can still even go to here, which is really the only place that you might say is beneficial for this course there's also here now, there's few cases where you're going to develop here. Um, for example in a weird opening where you might develop here is against uh, d4 if you get in a position like um, I don't know what's a what's a good position to say this I don't know you play something weird like here this is a strange move in the first place but then you get hit with the bishop move and then in this position it's good to play here why well, the idea is that if they ever take here, you can replace the knight, and that's generally why you're going to play it. It's also harder to add it, create attacks on the knight here when it's here instead of over here. So it's just generally harder to attack this knight, but it is more passive because it's not controlling squares on the enemy side of the board. So for the most part, knights are going to develop on. <laughs> that's not how knight, <laughs> knights are going to develop onto those two squares for the most part. For an example of a knight actually developing one of these off squares, once again, we're going to turn to this weird opening. And you can play something like this, and then you're going to see probably c5 here, here, a bishop here, and then you develop the knight. The knight gets developed here, and then you play c3, they play, I don't know, something like here, and then you're going to develop your knight here. So this is an example where you do do it. And the reason for, in this case, that you're doing it, they're going to play here. Uh, we're going to show you a few more moves in. The idea is to play knight c2. 
putting your knight on this square, which sometimes will happen. Sometimes you will be putting your knight on this square as well, if you do develop it here. But that's very rare where you're going to be playing an opening like that. Another uh, principle is the concept of developing at least one knight first. It's better to have one knight out before you develop any of your other pieces. Your other pieces kind of come after the knight. So, for example, you can play, you know, anything. But here, you're probably not going to develop the bishop first. You can, and this is called the bishop's opening. This is really the only good move here in this position where you can play the bishop before the knight. Besides that, there's Wayward, which isn't really that great. I mean, this will win you some games because of that trick I show, show, showed you earlier. But it's not that great because you're probably just going to get your queen kicked around if they know what they're doing, and then they'll just get a very nice position. Possibly you'll even blunder and get your pieces trapped. So it's probably better not to develop Activate the Queen by the, before really anywhere in the early in the opening it's a pretty late piece and you'll probably not be doing your bishop before your knight there's a few cases where you'll be playing a move like this and you'll be putting your bishop onto one of these squares but for the most part you'll be developing at least one knight first which is why i showed this there's of course also um, if you play this the petrov but that's a different story so here and then you develop, can develop your bishop or you can even develop your other knight too Developing both knights. This is a very solid principle way of playing, but you might find some difficulty in the four knights. So it's kind of too solid. If you actually play something like this, you might even find yourself losing after they play a nice tricky line. Oh, my screen's going crazy. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> What's going on? Or they'll play this interesting tricky line where they play like this. And you might even find yourself losing after this. You have to play bishop d3, but a lot of people you'll see is actually going to take this, which is a bit of an inaccuracy. If they do play the four knights, it's actually best to play into a four knight Spanish. But, you know, that's not too surprising. And they can no longer do the sacrifice because there's no fork. Um, there's also really weird openings, of course, which you can play from this position. But generally, you're going to be playing a bishop move or you'll play more solid. There's also, of course, uh, a central control, which all of our principles make sense when you look at the openings you can play from here. All right. So what's another good principle? Um, well, generally just another good thing to, just some good things to remember in openings is concepts. Another thing is you're not gonna push these two pawns too forward a lot. Generally, there's never a case you're gonna be pushing uh, these two pawns two squares forward. Besides in very specific cases, for example, a case where you would push them too forward is in this opening where you're gonna do this, you play this and if you do push it normally this pawn is pushed first if you are going to do it and they play something like this so this is a case where you would as it's supported by this and of course this concept is a very common concept in a lot of openings where you're going to ask this piece what are you doing here kind of trying to kick the piece out of your position or just have them trade it off because you're fine with them trading in this case you might say well why are you fine with them trading isn't this just isn't this just losing? They gained a pawn for free, right? Well, you see, the problem is it's going to be very hard to play after queen d4. This position is very good for black. So you don't really have to worry about them taking that pawn very much. So there are cases where you do have to know where this piece is going, though. And there are cases where you might actually be blundering. Um... So it's just a good thing to keep in mind that you might need to play one, might play one of these moves to try and get a piece out of your position when you don't like it there. You know, anyway. So why wouldn't you push these two pawns to forward normally? Well, this, which is classified as the worst opening, according to engines at engine level, is very clearly worse than say pushing at one square which is actually a playable opening which we'll discuss a little bit later so what's the idea of pushing this two forward the grob opening well the problems with the grob opening are pretty simple this pawn makes it so push here means you're probably not going to build a castle this way safely right which is the main way you castle in most chess games although you can castle long too 
Um, another problem is just generally this pawn is probably going to be lost because there's a natural attacker. Actually, the engine suggesting d5, just opening the bishop straight away to attack this pawn. And it doesn't even think you should try and defend it. Now, of course, this does open up the bishop, but there's just much way, better ways of doing that by playing this to try and get the bishop on the strong diagonal, which is called a fianchetto, which is actually why these two openings are kind of playable, or this move is just a playable move in general, is because you're going to try and put your bishop in control of strong diagonal with it, as we discussed earlier with peace activity. Generally, if you play a move like this, by the way, you're not going to be going here. There's very few cases you're going to develop your bishop onto this diagonal. So, besides that, besides that, there's just not much reasoning. Like, you're not going to get anywhere with this. It's worsening your ability. You can't really castle this way. There's better ways of developing to open this bishop up. It's just kind of letting them attack your pawn. Keen safety is even down because in this side because of the F pawn, right? So you never be able to block it like that. So that's just a very dangerous move. While in this case, it actually guards against the square, which means it's slightly safer. There's also the B pawn, which similarly is going right into this diagonal. Uh, and it's just kind of just a weird problem pawn. It's not as bad as the Grob, though, because it doesn't fall into keen safety problems. And you're probably not, ca you might not even castle along anyway. It's just the fact of the matter is, if you're going to play this, why would you play this when you can play this move? There's not much reason to. Of course, this is still not a great opening. The engine does not like the Nimso Larson attack as much. But it's still playable for most human level. Now, you may be asking what these two pawns are kind of for in a chess game, and you'll probably either be using them to take space in the future, maybe create an outpost, or they sometimes in in-games they can become very useful as well. They're also used, again, to kick out pieces that might land on one of these two squares. So, that's just a kind of basic concept of what you might use these two pawns for. Now, this pawn, again, with its kind of central control ideas. And, you know, we can look at the two pawns and kind of get a concept of how they're different. If you wanted to, where this is developing like this, while the other is developing. Anyway, it's not important. So now that we have kind of the basic principles down of how you're going to play an opening, you're thinking of piece activity. You want your pieces to be as active and do as much as possible in the position. You want to have as much you want central control again there are cases there is a case actually where central control might be taken advantage of where it's like and eh, central control really good so for example that is uh the opening known as the grunfeld defense where you're going to be playing something like this and the idea is that they're going to play this 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 and then this and the idea is that white gets a big center right look at all this center control they have such a nice center but the concept is that white's good center isn't actually that strong. And that's actually going to be a problem for them in the future. It's the idea of the Grunfeld defense. Which is considered a modern opening. So, now that you have all those not that all that knowledge going through your brain of how to play these openings. Um, also, you might want to discuss these two opening two pawn pushes in themselves because they block the development of your natural development squares, right? But they can also support pawns. And this is actually considered the worst opening by a lot of like high level players, not engines, because of the fact it blocks development and opens the key. Anyway, openings. For openings, you probably need to pick an opening for white, which pawn push you're gonna play and what you're gonna do against the most common two most common defenses, right? And then you'll probably, as time goes on, figure out how you're going to play against other defenses and slowly just get an arsenal for whatever move you decide is your first move, right? And for black, you really just mainly need a way a defense against e4 and d4. You may in the future want to have defenses against these openings as well. Or even maybe even weird openings like the Grob just to have study behind them. But that's up to you in the end. And it isn't as required. Uh, let me check how long I've been recording. 19 minutes. All right, I need to speed up. So, as white, let's start with white. 
So the most playable openings is probably e4 and d4, the most solid, most common openings in chess. And e4 is more tactical. It's going to end up being a lot more tactical positions and feel a little bit less solid. Why? Well, one, it's going to be, it opens up this bishop like this, which is, it opens up this bishop, which is very nice, which will help you castle kingside fast. And it opens up the queen, but this pawn is not defended. So the fact that this pawn isn't defended actually is a big deal in the opening. Unlike d4, which only opens up this bishop, this check diagonal is a lot stronger than the f-pawn one, as you can see. So, there's a lot of defense behind it, but it still might be used in certain cases, such as in the Nimsa witch defense, which is something like, uh, which is like, uh, oh, that's not right, I don't remember the exact line of how it's played. What's the line again? The Nimso, oh, it's the Nimso Indian, so you have to play it like, uh, you get something like this, 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 the Nimso Indian defense. So, the idea is here, but you might play it with check in some kind of weird line where you'd be like, Bogo Indian, and then you get into Nimso Indian 3 and Knights and something like that. Anyway, so, those are the two main ones, right? And you have to learn, if you're going to play this, you have to learn how you're going to respond against e5 and c5, the Sicilian and the symmetrical. Against e5, the best option is probably playing this instead of going for something maybe like this, like the Danish Gambit is possible as well. There's also um, the Vienna, which I showed briefly before, which are both playable, other playable ways of doing this. There's also, of course, the bishop's opening, but I would just recommend playing this and then playing an Italian after here, playing an Italian instead. So this is one way of playing if they choose to play this. There's, of course, the Petrov, which you might want to learn, but this is the main position if you're an E4 player you're probably going to have to deal with. And you have to decide if you're going to be a Spanish player or maybe you'll go for an Italian. Spanish is not really good for beginners. It's a very complicated opening with a lot of theory and ideas behind it. So it's more difficult. It can often feel boring. I more so recommend the Italian, which can still get into those aggressive, nice tactical positions, which is much easier to remember and learn. And from the Italian, you have things like the fried liver attack, which is here. As black, if you want to know how to play against the fried liver, you play here. They take with the pawn. You go here. They're probably going to play check. You block. They They'll probably take, they'll take with the queen. Very common move is you're probably going to get castles, and then you long castle. And by the way, just as a concept, when you have opposite side castling, so you two castle the opposite directions, you're probably going to launch attacks with each other with your pawns like this, and try to attack like that. As a concept for how this opening is going to go. There's also, of course, lines where they won't just, uh, after this, they won't play that, so they'll play back or something like that. And the idea then is to play h6 here, push, and they'll go here, probably. They'll probably try and go here or something like that, and then you take, they take, and then you'll play something crazy like bishop g4. And so there's a lot of different concepts and openings, and this gets very complicated. And apparently in this position, they have to play f3. You play ex3 here, here, and then here. So, yeah, it's a very complicated opening, but an interesting opening. But that's how you'd play, say, an Italian. And also there's ways of playing besides the fried liver against the two knights. And besides the two knights, by the way, there's also this, which is pretty common. So against the two knights defense, you can probably play d3 or c3. Uh, maybe even castle if you're a crazy person. I don't know what gambit this is called. But you can probably play d3. And then d3's position, there's all kinds of different lines that they can play. Uh, very common is something like this. Maybe you'll get probably this a few times. They might play something like this to try and stop you from playing the fried liver in the future. I don't really understand a6 that much. Uh, you probably won't see that very much. So you'll probably see a lot of this, though. And you'll pretty much play a very symmetrical opening. 
Anyway. Besides that, there's also the Scotch, which tries to go for a center control type opening where they attack the pawn with their pawn. So you're probably going to get something like this. After they take, you have multiple ideas. You can play the Scotch Gambit, an opening I've nicknamed the Psycho Gambit, which is actually crazy. I don't suggest it. Uh, or you can play the Goring Gambit, which is like an approved version of the Danish Gambit I showed earlier briefly, where you're going to play something like this, and it's just a very strong position. You're going to probably get hit with this Bishop Pin. This Bishop Pin seems fairly strong. Then you're going to play Bishop C4. And if they choose to develop here, you're going to hit them with e5. Or you can not play that. You can take, and then in that case, they might play. There's multiple lines. I personally play this line against the scotch. I don't really know any other lines very well. So you'd probably be best off taking a scotch course if you wanted to learn the scotch. Um, another line. There's so many lines that you can learn. Um, is maybe the Ponziani even which tries to build for this move d4 instead. So, anyway, you also have to know how to play against the Sicilian defense. Now, against the Sicilian defense, this is an excellent variation. It's very simple, and you're going to go onto this diagonal, possibly develop your knight inwards, in some cases real will develop here. You'll probably hit them with this maybe at some point, or you'll maybe even develop like this, which I told you was bad earlier. But there are in certain cases, it may be even the best move, as there's not really a better way of keeping this pawn defended. You may play this. So, for example, you might get something like this, 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 this as an opening. But, besides that, there's other lines against the Sicilian... Ooh, not the Karl Khan. The Sicilian defense. There's other lines. You have the Alapin. Not the Conquering. You have the Alapin defense. Which possibly builds for this, and I don't know the elephant very well. They'll probably play for something like this or this. Maybe this. I've seen this a couple of times. There's also the dragon Sicilian, where they'll try and play like this over here. Against the Sicilian, there's also the open and closed Sicilian, which might be called the main variations. You have the Smithmore Gambit, which just goes to get rid of this pawn immediately. And it doesn't really look like a gambit if you play it like this. You can, after this, there's also a line where you play this, which is the idea of kind of like a weird Danish gambit against the Sicilian, right? Um, there's also the Wien gambit, which I don't know much about, but you might want to look into. So that's if you want to be an E4 player. Maybe you're more interested in the solid lines of a D4 opening. Uh, this is probably way over the amount of time I wanted to be here, but... D4, but there's a lot of lines. Uh, for example, there's the famous Queen's Gambit against D5, against D5, which is one of the two main ones you have to deal with. It's probably D5, symmetrical, in the Indian game. So if you play against this, you'll probably play this, and you might get this. The Queen's Gambit declined with a Slav. You also have to deal with Accepted. So if they accepted your Gambit, and the idea is you're probably going to open this E-pawn at some point and try and take this Bishop. It's very hard for them to defend the pawn, so you'll probably win it back eventually. It's a very solid line and a very famous opening. Um, there's also the uh, London system, which is a very nice system to play. Probably a good system for beginners. A very common move, though, a very common thing in d4 openings is pushing the c-pawn before you develop your knight onto c3. So you'll play something like that almost always. There's also a world where you develop like this as well, Zucator variation, where you'll try and develop your knight here. They might even play a reversed version of the London, playing their own London system against you. So, you also have to deal with the Indian game, which has multiple ideas. You can also play C4 against this. They'll probably play something like this or this against it. And try to maybe open up the bishop here or here. So that's notable. And you might even have to deal with the exact Grunfeld defense I showed you earlier. So that could be fun. Grunfeld has a lot of theory. It's a very complicated opening. So generally, d4 is a fairly solid option. There's also the England Gambit to worry about. Just don't fall into the trap. Just make sure you play solid stuff. And you should be able to be fine against it. Then there's the Benoni as well. But mainly just these two lines. Against this, besides just here... 
uh, you do have here, and that's the main ones. There's also the Horwitz defense, which is notable to learn. So those are the main two openings. Those are the two most solid openings, e4 and d4. Now I'm going to briefly cover the rest of the openings, which is I have uh, three more that are very solid and two kind of less solid lines that you can play, but I wouldn't recommend as much. For example, you have the English opening. The English opening is fairly solid. They'll probably play this like a reverse Sicilian, which if you notice, this is essentially a backward Sicilian, where normally in the Sicilian you have the e-pawn and the c-pawn like this. It says the c-pawn and the e-pawn like this, which is very nice. Let's see if it texted me, if it's important or not. All right. So there's also the symmetrical variation, which is also important, where you'll probably get copied a lot. Now, generally in the English, the idea is to probably push this G-pawn and try and control like this. It's a very common theme in the English, just notably. There's a lot of different variations of the English. A lot of them are related to D-pawn openings. And honestly, you could even move back. If they don't play symmetrical, for example, you could move back. If they don't play these two moves, the most common moves, say they play this, you could just play right back into a D4 opening against the Indian, right? So... So that's a very, it's an interesting opening that you can play. It's very playable. Another idea is the ready opening. Now this opening is a very versatile opening. Essentially the concept is, I'm probably going to play this move anyway, so I might as well play it straight away. Depending on what your opponent, it also stops the move here, so they can't play like this. So a very common move is just to, to copy you. And the idea is you'll probably either be going for something like this, or you'll be opening up like this, is a lot of what the readies will B. There is also something like maybe the Sicilian variation where you'll play e4 more likely. Or maybe you don't like the Sicilian, so you're going to play something like, you know, c4 or knight c3 to avoid going to a Sicilian. The last opening is the Keynes Fianchetto opening, where the idea is to put this bishop on this square. And you're pretty safe here, and you're just going to try and develop out like this. This might turn into a ready, or it might turn into a english later on so it's very versatile and can go into a lot of other lines depending on how it's played similarly to this line where it also can go into a lot of lines now there are two more openings that are both playable technically but i wouldn't recommend them as much we have the vont courageous opening which for a lot of it's a very passive opening and you'll kind of have a hard time getting out if you play this move you probably want to play like this with it, where you're going to try and put your knight on this square and kind of attack the center, maybe like this, and castle alongside. Maybe that's one way to play it. I don't know. This is a very strange opening. You also might play it like a reverse French, you know, play it like this. So, it's a very interesting opening, but it's not very good at human level and has a very bad win rate, so I would not recommend it. Now, of the two weird ones, I'd recommend this one more, the Saragossa opening. Because essentially it's like if you play the Karo Khan against e4, which is this, and you're like, I really like that. So then you might be like, all right, I'm going to play against d4 too. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, that was, that was going well. What if I played as white? That's basically what this is. So you're going to play stuff like, you know, if they play like this, you're playing this, which is like a reverse Karo Khan. It's very solid. And it's a very playable opening, an exotic opening, so your opponent will be thrown off by it, and it's a very interesting opening. And if you play it, stuff like that is black. It might actually be very easy for you and come naturally. But you'd have to study these two a lot your own, because there's not a lot online about them. Unlike all the other ones, which E4 and D4 have a lot of stuff you can look up online about them. Now let's go on to your openings for black. I said you had to have a response against e4, and you had to have a response against d4, the two most common openings. Against e4, there are a few, there are multiple options. The main options is, of course, the symmetrical or the Sicilian. You already saw a few of those lines and a lot of the ideas in them. Of course, you have this type of stuff where they'll probably play maybe a Spanish, and you'll play either a Berlin, or you'll play the Morphe variation now. There are even weirder variations you might even go for, like this maybe, you know, the classical defense or the Fianchetto defense. But those are very difficult, and I wouldn't recommend them as much. 
You also have the Italian, which again, I recommend the Berlin. Uh, you can play the Berlin type variation. You also have stuff like playing the bishop here, which is a very common one. Besides that, I really don't know what you'd play against it. There is d6, but I wouldn't recommend it. And against this, you have to deal with playing against the fried liver, as I showed earlier. And, of course, just kind of knowing this. Also, of course, it's good to know that this trick exists if you are black and playing this opening. As it's a very nice way of playing against it and just getting a nice position in the opening. So... But you could also play the Sicilian. Now, I'm not a very good expert on the Sicilian, but there's a lot of ideas related to playing like this. So they might play a variation like this, and then you'll play like maybe like this or d6. So you have a lot of ideas. There's also the dragon, where again, you're going to try and open up over here. I'm not a Sicilian expert, so I recommend looking up online more. Uh, there's also more variations, of course. There's the French and the Karl Kahn, which are very similar, and the Karl Kahn blocks your development of your knight technically but is doesn't block the development of the bishop technically and is a very interesting opening it's considered to be a bit less dynamic and maybe a little bit less solid by some but it does have a very nice pawn structure you might get with it and there's also of course similarly the french which has several ideas normally you play this there's also the franco-sicilian with this but for the most part you're going to be playing like this and attacking the center like that so you can definitely study these two lines and probably it's best to play them to see which one you like more if you want to go for one of them and of course there are two other ones as well the nimso witch defense where you're going to bring out your knight to try and play this before you even push your pawn here They'll probably try and take the center, and then you can go for the Kennedy variation, or you can go for this interesting, almost kind of similar to Scandinavian in some aspects, which is an interesting way of playing against it. Or you can play like this, which is a very another interesting way. Or, and there's the other one you can play, which is the modern defense, where you go for this type of stuff, which I showed you earlier, and give your opponent the whole center. And then go for the bishop to control it. So now that we're getting to ridiculously long periods of time, we're at 37 minutes, which is a lot. Uh, we have d4. <laughs> it's d4, again, the main variations is d5 and knight f6, which I already showed you earlier. This, you're going to have to deal with the Danish uh, queen's gambit, which I don't really suggest taking. You'll probably either play the decline or you'll play the slav and if you play the Karl Kahn I probably recommend the slav honestly but you may not like it very much you also have to learn how to deal with something like the Zuckertor variation or maybe play against the London system as well so and generally these ideas is you're probably going to get a lot of stuff like this and it's a very solid system where they're going to fight for probably this square from my understanding of it. I'm not a d4 player, so I don't know the openings as well. I'm not a d4 or d5 player, so I don't know the ideas of those that much. I have instead put the Indian defense personally, controlling these squares with my knight. And depending on what they play, you might go for something like this, the King's Indian, or you might go for something like this, the East Indian. Uh, there's also the Slav Indian even. You can play the Mexican tango if you're the Black Knights tango if you want, <laughs> if you're crazy. But so you're just gonna play like this. There's also other lines, of course, where they might play the London against even Indian. I personally love this line with b6, trying to get this out and control it like this. Uh, Magnus Carlsen played this in the Fide Cup or whatever against someone, I don't remember who recently. But there's also, of course, g6. You could play c5, attacking this pawn. You could play... Like, there's all kinds of lines. Is there g6? Yeah, you could play g6. There's a lot you can do against this and play against the London here. There's even this line where you play knight h5, attacking the London bishop like this, which is very interesting. You also have here, where you try and defend this pawn. Try and defend the pawn. That, you know, kind of similar to Zucretort. I personally play an offbeat line with h6, but that's not really recommended. And so you could probably play stuff like d5 or e6 here if you want to. 
Anyway, besides these two, you also have this weird opening, which a lot of times either turns into a, a Slav defense, or it turns into a Karl Khan defense. Or they play something weirder against you, like here or something, and it turns into neither, and it turns into a Slav Indian, or a Czech Indian in this case. So, there's a lot of different ideas you can play against this. There's also the Hortzwitz, which is way better than this. The Hortzwitz will possibly turn into a French defense. Or, it can turn into a lot of other lines with the knight, possibly. If they play here, maybe you'll bring out your knight. So, you have a lot of different ideas that you might play, or you might prefer to go here. So, the Hortzwitz is an interesting line where you'll try and play into very different openings. And it's very playable to go into deep these type of either of these two openings really uh what's another one you can try and play the modern against this as well with the bishop very similar exact same really uh what's another line that i'm forgetting i feel like i'm forgetting something but i'm not remembering it right now oh yeah but of course there was the dutch but i'm not going to cover the dutch i don't recommend the dutch really i mean unless you're more intermediate where you'll find people i can teach it way better than i can so, that's really it. That's all you need. Now that you've picked what you're going to play as black, you pick what you're going to play as white. You have a lot of stuff under your belt, and you know the principles, you'll probably be good to go in a lot of openings. There are openings you'll probably struggle in. For example, anti-positional openings are a lot more difficult. An uh, example, again, of an anti-positional opening would be this opening. This opening ends up being very anti-positional. After you get something like here, 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 and then you get something like, eh, there's a lot of lines, they'll probably, oh, uh, yeah, 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 I forgot about this. You play bishop e2, and then they play something crazy like e6, they play e6, and they might not play this variation, by the way, this is just the best moves I'm looking at from memory. You play this, and then they develop their knight out, and then you develop your knight out, and you see how anti-positional. It's going against a lot of rules that you learned. So, you might struggle a bit in those openings, but besides that, you'll be pretty good at most openings. So, you can go out into the world and know that you know how to play a good opening.